laughter is the tangible evidence of hope. Like no matter where a person is, if they could just laugh, then you know that there's hope. But more importantly, they know it too. And from that position, I can now deposit some words of encouragement and maybe even some tactical plans on what they can do to get to and stay at a better place. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. As we look to whether we're making a difference with our lives or in the lives of others around us, we can tend to measure ourselves based on our performance. Whether we're reaching for accolades in our careers or comparing ourselves with others on social media. In Ephesians, we're told, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. No matter what we achieve or don't achieve, God's grace is given to us all the same. And at the end of the day, our performance can only get us so far. Our guests today spend a lot of time performing for others, one on a stage and the other on the football field. We're talking to comedian Michael Jr. and NFL player Jordan Matthews. Known as one of today's most gifted comedians, Michael Jr. believes that laughter can bring understanding, and he takes being funny very seriously. Though he's had the opportunity to perform on the same stages as legends like Jerry Seinfeld, George Wallace, Chris Rock, and others, he now tours the country using comedy to inspire audiences to activate their purpose and live a life fulfilled. Michael's mission is to make laughter commonplace in uncommon places, such as homeless shelters and prisons. He shares how he got a start and why he believes encouragement in the form of laughter is life-changing. I am Michael Jr. and I actually get to use comedy to inspire people to walk in purpose. So I'm 18 years old and everybody's, you know, they're thinking about what they're going to do after high school. And they had these plan. One guy had a full ride scholarship. This other guy was going to his art school and somebody was going to the service or something. And people asked me what I was doing after school. I was like, uh, I'm probably going to go make a sandwich or something. So I didn't have like a, a plan plan. We went to the movies after graduation. I remember me and a bunch of friends just went to the movies and we're at this movie theater. And in the middle of the movie, the screen goes blank. Like literally it just goes blank. And uh, my friend, a German exchange student, he says to me, I dare you go tell a joke. That's what he said. That, that's my best German accent. So he's like, I dare you go tell a joke. And at the time, you dare me to do something, I'm going to do it. I'm like 18 years old. So the only joke I knew at the time that I could just tell people was a, was a dirty joke. But me and another friend who also was in attendance had this deal that we wouldn't curse or use any a certain language. If we did, he could hit me in the chest hard as he wanted to. And that deal we made at the age 14. And he was in the audience. And I'm like, yo, I don't want to get hit in the chest. I'm not trying to start MMA. Like, I just want to. So on my way down to tell this joke, it was actually a stage in front of the uh, screen that had went blank and they turned the house lights on. On my way down there, I had to rewrite this joke in my head. I'm like, okay, I got to remove this stuff and take this out and change these words. And I'm doing all of this math in my head. So I go down there and I present this joke and this whole audience falls out laughing. And I feel a high for the first time ever in my life. I've never done drugs. I've never had alcohol before. Well, I had some NyQuil once. That stuff is bananas. So I tell this, and then and the audience wants more comedy, but I don't have any more. So I go sit myself down because I know when to get out. And they're all applauding and they're excited. And the security comes looking, comes running down and they're looking for me. Where's that kid at? Where's he at? And they're going to kick me out. And this lady stands up. I've never met her before. I don't know this lady. She stands up and says, if you kick that young man out, I want my money back. I don't even know this lady. And then this, these bikers with long hair and tattoos, like, yeah, you kick them out, we want our money back. It was amazing. All of these people who I never even knew before gave me all this love because I gave them a part of me. Now, in retrospect, I can clearly see that was really like God giving me a glimpse of what he called for me to do. But I used to just think it was me getting a glimpse of making people laugh. But the glimpse I really got was me using comedy to bring people together for something bigger than themselves, which is what I do now. I moved to New York City from Michigan and on New Year's Eve, 2000, New Year's Eve of 2000, it was about to turn to 2001. And I remember doing a show at Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle in Detroit. And my whole car was packed up with all my belongings. Everything I owned in life was inside of my 1997 Chevy Lumina. And um, I remember it was 1143. 
It's like 16, 17 minutes before the new year. I got off stage, probably got a standing ovation because that sounds like a better story. And then um, and I got in my car, started up and headed to New York City and drove through the night till I got to uh, New York City. Because in New York, like literally, I know uh, Frank Sinatra said it, but if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. But I was like, I just want to find out if I'm funny, if I can handle these stages. And then this comedian named George Wallace came into the club one night and he saw my show and he was like, man, you're funny and you're clean. He, was, he, he said, why don't you curse? And I was like, I don't know, man. What if my grandmother walk in or something? I don't want to. But the truth was, I didn't curse because it kind of stuck because that deal me and my friend made when we were 14 years old. So I just didn't have that part of my show. And he liked the show so much. He said, you know what? You're funny. Why don't you do a show with me and my best friend a couple nights? I'd like to have you. And I was, listen, I was broke. It was, it was only like three weeks. I was probably there for about a m- month before I couldn't afford my apartment anymore. But here's the issue with doing the show with him. The show was in, he said to me, would you like to do a show with me and my best friend? I didn't know who his best friend was. And then I find out his best friend is Jerry Seinfeld. And then you think about the, the show Seinfeld. What was Seinfeld's best friend in the movie? His name was George, named after his true best friend in real life, George Wallace, who sees my show, says I'm funny. You want to do a show with me and Jerry? I don't know if I'm going to get paid because you can't say, yeah, I want to do it. Like I'm a starving artist. Anybody would pay him to be able to get on stage with him. But I don't know if I'm going to get paid. And I had approximately $14 to my name. I would buy a foot long Subway meatball sub for $5 and split it and eat half of it about 11 o'clock and then eat the other half later. The issue is the show is in New Jersey. So I'm excited about going. But the problem is if I go there, I I have enough gas where I could probably get to the show. And I'm all excited. I'm going to do this show. But then I realize I got $14 and there I can get to New Jersey. I got enough gas. But if I'm not getting paid for this show. There's an eight dollar toll to get back. And I'd already bought a sub and I had to put gas in my car to get there. I only had six dollars. So if I would have got to New Jersey, not gotten paid, I wouldn't be able to get back to New York. Literally, I was in that position. I'm like, what am I going to do? So anyway, I get to the club. and It's beautiful. And the the thing I remember most about the club was the smell because they had this stuff there called food. Like it was warm food. I had to. I was like, what is this? And then I go there and I can eat. And then there's George Wallace, Jerry Seinfeld. And I do a show and I got two standing ovations and I rip and I'm tearing up. Right. And then um, after the show was over, the club manager walks up to me, said, Michael, hey, you got a great set. Would you like to go to church with me tomorrow? I was like, church? What are you not? What? Church for what? Like only time I went to church when I was a kid and it was miserable. And it last nine hours. My grandmother would force us to go. Dude yelling and screaming. Got some phlegm in his throat. <laughs> I'm like, what are you? Doing? No. So I'm like, church? Why would I go to church? No, I don't want to go to church. And then 20 minutes later, his fiance, who was beautiful, asked me the same question. She was like, Michael Jr., would you like to go to church with us? I was like, I was just looking for a church the other day. Yes, I want to go to church. So she gives me the address to the church. And she writes it on a napkin. And I had this great show. The crowd is all filed out and everybody's gone. And then the reality starts to hit me. I'm on my way back to my car. I have not been paid. I don't know where I'm going right now. And, and, and uh, what I didn't mention is on my way in, there was a bouncer at the door who wouldn't let me in at first. Then when I said my name, he was like, oh, George Ross said you was coming through. And the dude let me in. So I'm leaving, walking to my car. I don't know where I'm going to go from here. I don't have enough gas to get back to Michigan. I don't have enough. I don't, I don't have to, like, I got nothing. I'm walking. And then that bouncer said, he said, yo, uh, yo, Michael. I was like, yeah, what's up? He said, come here. And he gave me a, a, a five. Like he, like we kind of slapped hands, but it wasn't as crisp as it was on the way in the door because there was some paper in his hand when he touched my hand. And you don't look at it. When somebody hand you some money, you don't look, but you can know it's money. And we just made eye contact. I walked to my car and I was hoping because in New York, you don't get paid much money for doing comedy. You just don't. It's not unlikely for you to met the most New York. You get 12 bucks or something for doing a show. Literally, it's super low. So I'm hoping it's if I know it's two bills in my hand. I could feel that it's two bills, but I'm hoping it's if it is a if it's two tens, that'll be awesome. I can get back to New York, do a couple shows and stay there as long as I can. Hopefully get some. But if it's two twenties, I'm going to be ecstatic. So I go into my car, I shut the door and uh, I remember closing the door and I looked down 
and I open my hand slowly. I don't know why I did one finger at a time. I don't know. I'm just a, but I open my hand slowly. And as I look, it's hard to see the bills because my eyes start to water as I notice it is two $100 bills. I am done. And when my eyes are done watering, the next thing I know, I, I look over at the seat next to me and that napkin with the address to that church is there. And I'm like, I am going. And I, and I go to this church and this dude is up on stage talking about Jesus and he's just talking. He's not yelling. He's not screaming. He don't got no perm. Dude just, dude is just talking about Jesus. Then he did an altar call and he said, if you want Jesus in your life, come forward. And I was like, ah, uh, no, nah, I'm cool. I mean, I'm not doing it. I wanted to. I told myself I'd read the whole Bible first. I even have a Bible. And then out of nowhere, this lady just hands me a Bible. We don't even exchange words. She just hand me a Bible. It's like a daily. So I, I started reading the Bible and going to church, reading the Bible, going to church. And I really want to get my life over to Jesus. But I told myself I'd finish the Bible first. So I'm digging into the Bible, reading. I'm putting in like 14 hours a day. All I'm doing is reading the Bible, hitting the clubs, going to church. It took me 36 days to read the Bible. I remember going to the altar after I finished reading it, like during the announcements, I was like, hey, I know y'all got a picnic, but is Jesus here right now? I don't know how this works. And I give my life over to Jesus and now I realize I'm not just funny, I'm funny for a reason. Like there's purpose behind me having this sense of humor. Like God wants me to use this to help his people in a significant, so it's just super exciting to be able to see this and notice and feel it and have it as real that God gave me this gift not to serve me, not so I can do a bunch of shows and get a bunch of people all, and just laugh. No, it's so much more to do than just laughter. Comedy is the vehicle. It is not the destination. So I have a nonprofit called uh, Red Blueprint. Our slogan, actually, I should say our assignment is to make laughter commonplace in uncommon places. So we'll go to homeless shelters and prisons and abuse children facilities and we take comedy there. And the reason we do it is because I understand that laughter is the tangible evidence of hope. Like no matter where a person is, if they could just laugh, then you know that there's hope. But more importantly, they know it too. And from that position, I can now deposit some words of encouragement and maybe even some tactical plans on what they can do to get to and stay at a better place. Like we just went to this women's prison and it's so amazing because at the beginning their faces are all frowned up. But then I went in there with the jokes and this whole room is just explode. Like it's just a room full of women. They all got on these white jumpsuits and they're just exploding in laughter. It's just so awesome. And they're in prison. The reason people are so attracted to what we're doing is because of laughter. Like people are attracted to laughter. And what happens is there's a there's a neurological uh, association that happens with information when it's when you have an emotional response attached to it so what I mean is is if you're laughing and learning because the endorphins are released while you're learning after you've learned what you learn you will still be attracted to more of that information I'm called to help people understand their purpose. So we've been digging into understanding purpose and what tactics it takes to help somebody understand their purpose. And I've been studying this for probably six years now. There's one lady in particular, I can still see her face. She said to me, I had God in a box. I did not know that God could use such a thing to open up so many hearts, but it's open mind. So I, so just me doing I want to make laughter commonplace in uncommon places I'm just doing what I do and share these stories and it's amazing the effect it gets to have on people and I have along with obviously the Bible which is you know God gives us he's the one who gave us the purpose learn how you can support the work Michael is doing by visiting michaeljr.com stay tuned to Jordan Matthews story after a brief message Jesus Calling, the story of Easter, from best-selling author Sarah Young, uses vibrant illustrations, storytelling from throughout the Bible, and short Jesus Calling devotions to show how Easter was part of God's plan from the very beginning. Available in both a picture book and board book format, Jesus Calling, the story of Easter can be found wherever books are sold.
Our next guest is San Francisco 49ers wide receiver, Jordan Matthews, who was living his life on his own terms and measured himself by how well he did in the sport of football until he noticed how some of his fellow NFL players seem to have a different way of handling the ups and downs in the world of football and seem to have peace in their lives. And Jordan became curious as to how this was possible. When he realized that it was Jesus who transformed the way they viewed the world, he wanted in because a relationship with God, unlike a career in the NFL, isn't performance-based. I grew up in the South where, you know, Mississippi, you know, growing up, if that my grandma would joke, you can go out Saturday night, you can hang out as long as you want, but you're getting up on Sunday. That's, that's just how we grew up. So it was like six days a week. So just say, oh, I grew up in church. I'm like, I don't do it justice. Like we were in some aspect of learning about the gospel or being around the Bible six days a week, every single week that I was growing up. So it was definitely a huge part, huge part of my life. I knew a ton about the Bible. Like I knew by that point in my life, I could, if somebody said a verse or said a story, I could kind of at least map out the story for you or know, okay, that's old or that's new. So I could sound smart in discussion, um, but the relationship was not real at all. What I knew about the gospel had not shaped who I was as a person. It did not shape how I felt about the sin in my life. It didn't, um, it didn't contradict my way of living. I was still 100% Lord of my life. And so it was probably my second year in the league. I had a really good first year, played really well. And as a rookie, that's a lot coming at you. Well, when I started having a bad second year early on, finished good, but at the early part, it was bad. I had this autograph signing that I would do. It was like this Philly Expo every year. So my first year I go, I had a line out the door. I'm talking about, you know, it was literally out of the building and wrapped around. Like, there were just so many fans that were coming to get things signed um, by me. Well, I, had the best start to my second year. I go to the same Philly Expo. And at that point, I might have had like 10 people show up. Now, like I said, this is not a knock on Philly fans or anything. This is just a story. It's just the truth. At that point, it rocked me at the time, you know, because I was a very, very vulnerable person at the time. I was just a person that I just believed everybody loved me. Like, okay, yeah, they, they they see how hard I work and they appreciate what I bring to the team. And I started to realize that, no, like football is just almost like any other institution in the world is is performance based. Everything man made 100 percent is always going to be performance based. If you don't meet this criteria, you're out, you're done. And I had that sad revelation as a second year player in the NFL. I was only like 23. Well, Around the building, I just sometimes just watch guys. I was always an observer of people and their character. And I would notice, you know, when we were winning, there were guys who were like this. We were losing, a lot of guys were like this. When individual guys would be injured, they'd be down here. When they were playing well, they'd be up here. And there were a couple guys that were just like this, no matter what. Whether we were winning, losing, they were injured, maybe a problem at home, Coach didn't like them, undrafted, new contract, no new contract, contract dispute, didn't matter. It was like this. A couple guys. One of the guys was Trey Burton. Another guy was Chris Maragos. Nick Foles was another one. And then I started spending time around these guys. I'm like, man, what makes these guys so different? You know? And I realized that those those pages in the in the word, they weren't just words on a page. Those things meant something to them. They were in their word and it transformed the way they looked at life. It transformed the way that they parented, the way they were as husbands. And so they were like, you know, okay, well, we lost the game. Who cares? <laughs> Yahweh's still on the throne. Like they had this mindset that was eternally focused. And they knew that, you know, the Savior came down and did all the work. So yeah, we're in this performance-based institution, but at the same time, I at least don't have one relationship where it doesn't matter how I perform. So there's freedom in that. And I was like, look, you know, Lord, like I know I haven't been doing this thing right. I know that I'm probably still gonna mess up a ton, but I know this whole thing is about you. And I can't save myself, so it's up to you to do it. And I feel that happening right now. And then that, at that point, I said, this thing is real. And it's now on me to tell as many people about it as possible, about how real it is, to 
try my best to live it out every way possible and just to walk in the spirit, man. It's one of my favorite things about Galatians 5. It talks about walking in the spirit. I think a lot of times we'll go to that one, you know, Christian conference and we leave and we try to run in the spirit and then we trip and get a bad scab and we're like, oh, I hurt. And then we like, this ain't worth it. It's like, no, nah, that's why you're meant to walk because none of us can do it on our own. It's going to take a lot of people. It's going to take a village. And it's just going to take that constant effort, you know, making every effort. And so I've been walking in the spirit ever since. Like I said, there's good days, there's bad days, but at no point has my faith ever been rocked again. And I know that I have a foundation that I can stand on and a relationship that can't be taken away no matter my performance. And that's something that's very freeing. You know, like a lot of people always ask me, like, man, Jordan, why don't you have a, you know, Instagram? Why don't you? And, I, and really, I don't, I feel weird if I post stuff to put up a facade like I'm perfect. Like if I post pictures and I have this whole grid and you see me smiling with my family and you see me making a catch in a football game and you see me in a picture with somebody famous and you see another picture of me, you're going to think, oh, this guy got it. He's got it. And I never want to put off that persona because I was like, no, this is a daily grind. I'm not going to act like it's easy. And that's why I don't perpetuate or post a quote unquote life that looks like I'm just like this Christian walk is just easy. I'd rather you call me, we can have a conversation. I can show you, hey, this thing's real, but there's nothing better than, than, than doing this walk. And so it's been great. I just can't tell you enough about how much just the gospel has been able to shape my career and being able just to keep me on a solid foundation, no matter all the ups and downs. I mean, I moved like four times last year, man. I ended last year with the Eagles. I caught a touchdown in the second round of the playoffs in January. I signed with the 49ers in March. I go to OTAs with the 49ers. I moved to San Francisco. Okay, so I'm in San Francisco till June. After June, I leave. I go to D.C. My wife plays professional soccer in D.C. I train in D.C. there, so I move all my stuff to D.C. Then I move back to San Francisco for training camp in August. I'm in training camp the whole month from August to September. I get cut from the 49ers. I leave. I go back to D.C. I had to move all this stuff back to, to D.C. Then the 49ers sign me again. OK, after three weeks, I go back to San Fran. I'm with the 49ers for like four weeks. They cut me again. So then I'm in San Francisco for a week. And this is after my family moves down there. OK, then the Philadelphia Eagles sign me for three weeks. I move up to Philadelphia, move all my stuff to Philadelphia. I play two games with the Eagles. I finally move into the place that I'm going to move into, ship both cars, move my wife, my son in. The Eagles release me. After the Eagles release me, I move to this place in Nashville where we're sitting right now. And at that point, honestly, I was content. I was like, hey, you know, this is obviously what you have for me, Lord, so it's all good. And we get everything set up, we're chilling. The 49ers call me back. So then I had to move all my stuff back to San Francisco again. And then we're there till the Super Bowl. That was my last year. That was in one year. And, you know, if I didn't have the gospel, I wouldn't want off the rails, you know? But that time was still able to be fruitful. I learned a lot of stuff. There were some great parts, there were some high points, there were some low points. But at the same time, um, we came out of it, me, my family, we came out of that stronger. Um, and I came out of that, you know, a lot closer to the Lord and I'm thankful for it. I was like, wow, God, like if I didn't have a, all this movement, I wouldn't have the tools right now to go into a class and completely understand what Super Bowl teams look like in three different places. And at that time I was like, I'm way too blessed to be in the hole about getting traded from NFL team. There's so much more work for the gospel that I can be doing. There's a reason why the Lord allowed me to come here. And I end up finding out that reason now because I've got a really close relationship with a guy who plays for the Raiders now. He was a young rookie and we were able to do a Bible study together. And he said that Bible study meant the world to him. You know, just, just dive in the world with somebody who was older. But I just felt like the gospel was able to give me perspective. You know, I, I don't serve a God who sat on a throne and didn't know what suffering was. He came down and, and he did the work and he suffered. So I'm like, dude, if he can go through that for me, like I can go through this for somebody else. 
Jordan wraps his time with us by sharing the October 16th passage of Jesus Calling, which underscores the message of how he was able to find peace, even in the midst of tumultuous times. Look to me continually for help, comfort, and companionship, because I'm always by your side. The briefest glance can connect you with me. When you look to me for help, it flows freely from my presence. This recognition of your need for me in small matters, as well as in large ones, keep you spiritually alive. When you need comfort, I love to enfold you in my arms. I enable you not only to feel comforted, but also to be a channel through whom I comfort others. Thus you are doubly blessed, because a living channel absorbs some of whatever flows through it. My constant companionship is the peace day resistance, the summit of salvation blessings. No matter what losses you experience in your life, no one can take away this glorious gift. I sought the Lord and He answered me. He delivered me from all of my fears. Those who look to Him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard me. He saved him out of all his troubles. Psalm 34, 4-6 Look to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face always. Psalm 105, 4 Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4 You can connect with Jordan through Twitter and look for him on the football field during the regular NFL season this fall. If you'd like to hear more stories about how we can find peace over performing, check out our interview with rodeo champion Trevor Brazil. Next time on the Jesus Calling podcast, we talk with British singer Misha Paris, who shares how growing up in the church shaped her life and the simple truth she learned from her grandmother and grandfather about prayer, which kept her grounded in the most difficult times of her life. Every single disappointment that I've been through, it's my faith that's got me through it. Because that's what grandma always used to say and granddad. They say, whenever you're going through it, Mish, get on your knees. Just get on your knees, girl. And I swear, I don't care if you don't believe in anything, I, but I have to tell you, if I never had that, there's no way I could still be here 33 year, years later and still have my faculties intact. Want to hear more inspirational stories of people who have been changed by a closer walk with God? Then subscribe today to the Jesus Calling Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please be sure to leave a review, which helps us reach and inspire others with these stories. Plus, if you like seeing our guests as well as hearing them, you can find video interviews available on our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Jesus Calling Book, on Facebook, and on the Jesus Calling Instagram page.